Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Let's start our video with a story about a frustrating encounter. A person was leaving a friend's house when suddenly they were harassed by a man and his wife. But before we begin, best way to support our channel is to leave comments, like, and subscribe with the turned on bell so you don't miss the new video every single day. Here we go. Guy filed a police report and then a car insurance claim for a hit and run I never committed. Okay, so long story short, I was being harassed by this guy and his wife. The guy's tone had escalated and I got kind of nervous, so I decided I was going to get in my car and leave. I'd stopped at a friend's house in the neighborhood but was already in the process of leaving when he approached me and started harassing me. I assumed he mistook me for someone else, so I tried to ignore him. But when I got in my car, he instructed his wife to back her car behind mine to block me in, and he leaned over my hood to try and prevent me from leaving. I told him to move, but he was adamant on making sure I stayed there, so I backed up slightly and then put my car in drive. But as I do that, I hear him screaming, You hit my car! You hit my car! I didn't hit his car, though. Granted, his wife had made sure I was extremely close to his vehicle by blocking me in, but we never even touched. No paint transfer, no bumper damage, no contact whatsoever. I pulled forward and made a couple of further jolts forward to startle him into moving out from in front of my car and then I sped off to get away from the crazies. Fast forward about an hour and I have two policemen knocking on my door. They asked me if I had hit this guy's car to which I replied no, I definitely did not hit his car. They said they believe I didn't hit the car either because when they investigated his vehicle there was no damage whatsoever. The man also said that I ran him over and left him laying in the road. This man not only did not get run over, but he tried to chase me half a block up the street before slowing down and giving up. Yesterday morning, I wake up to a bunch of text messages from my car insurance company saying a claim had been started and they would be reviewing the information provided. I never called them, I never started a claim. My best guess is the guy got the police report and then filed with my car's insurance company but no one has really told me anything. The man's obviously crazy or whatever, but he's made some serious big boy moves in his crazy stupor, and as a result, I'm almost concerned either the police or the insurance people or both will believe him. I have a doorbell camera where you can clearly see the police officers that came to visit me admitting there was no damage on the car and that they didn't think I actually hit it, but that's all I've really got as far as evidence. Edit. Thanks everyone for your input. I wanted to come back here and update you all and let you know my insurance company, obviously, found me not liable and I didn't have to do much except give a recorded statement and take pictures of the front, back, and sides of my car. My insurance company didn't even call me to tell me the good news. I noticed it was closed and I wasn't liable when I logged into the app to pay my bill. Guess they too thought it was just a bunch of BS. I'm glad to hear that your insurance company found you not liable for the incident with that aggressive individual. And our second story. You want me to cancel this job completely? Okay. Okay, so this is a story my dad told me some time ago, and I'm sorry that I can't double check with details. R.I.P. Dad, T.T. But this is what I can remember. My dad used to be field maintenance for the post office. Basically, if a mail truck broke down, dad would go out with a special truck to tow it. Priority over all other things, usually. If post office machinery needed wrenching, dad did it. Moderately high priority. If a blue mailbox needed a paint touch-up, dad did it. Very low priority. One day, dad gets sent on a job out into a post office in the boonies. Nearly a three and a half hour long drive, one way, if traffic was favorable. This job was to repaint the parking lot. You can figure that this job wasn't exactly high priority, so they've already been waiting quite a while for it to happen. Dad gets to the site, and the equivalent of the floor manager gets snippy with Dad, telling him that he was just going to have to sit on his hands and wait for two more hours. Apparently, floor manager had some project planned for that day that would require moving a bunch of stuff outside temporarily, using up the parking lot space. He fully expected my dad to stand around and wait for this job to be done. Dad. You filed a work order, and you've been scheduled for this job for a while now. You knew what date I was going to be arriving. I'm here. Floor manager, pompously, you're going to wait. Dad, no, I'm not. I'm starting the job I was sent to do. 
Dad spins on his heels and heads for his work truck to grab the equipment. The floor manager charges outside, screaming at the top of his lungs. Floor manager. You will not paint this right now. You will paint when I say you can paint, and I say you will wait two hours. Dad, looking absolutely pissed. If I put my equipment back in my truck, I will close the work order, and you will have to file another one. The floor manager storms inside and returns with the postmaster of that post office, a spineless, sniveling, hand-wringing twig of a man. Postmaster, look, I know you're here to do this job we requested, but really, is it so much to ask for you to wait until this project is finished? It's only two hours. Dad, icily, I drove three and a half hours to get here. Either I start right now and head for my home base on time, or I close the work order and end the job. The postmaster whimpers and wheedles and wrings his hands, then nods. Close the work order, I'll file another job order and you can return tomorrow. Dad smiles thinly, nods, and climbs back into his truck to head back to his home post office. He then calls his own postmaster and explains what happened. His postmaster, well, give them what they want, close the work order. Now, here's the malicious part of the compliance. Dad and only eight other guys covered an area approximately 250 miles or so. So yeah, way understaffed. Edit. For visual, IIRC, he had stories from Redding, California to the north and down to Bakersfield, California in the south. Pull out your Google Maps for that bad boy. They managed a well-oiled machine routine to let jobs accumulate, then spend a day doing those jobs in that direction, then picking another direction with another bunch of jobs. Also, in order to get any requested jobs done, there was a whole bureaucratic mess to make it happen. You had to write up a work order, send it in, get put on a waiting list, and hope that a bunch of broken down trucks didn't bump you farther down the list than you already were. If your work order was closed, whether or not it was actually completed, the job was considered fulfilled, which means that it could not just be reopened. They'd have to file a completely new work order and be listed accordingly in the many, many higher priority jobs. Since this post office was out in the boondocks with an extremely low priority job on a very understaffed workforce, They've essentially shot themselves in the foot by refusing to let Dad get started immediately. I can neither confirm nor deny that the new work order mysteriously dropped to the bottom of the list of priorities a few more times than necessary, but I can confirm that it was at least a further three months before that parking lot got painted. The floor manager made himself scarce, and the spineless postmaster was very, very quiet when he signed off on the work order's completion. Only three months? They can't have been that understaffed then. I could easily see the job getting bumped for three years without much trouble. And our next story. Mentally ill man invaded our home. So this happened yesterday. My brother and his girlfriend came to visit us and our kids. Normally we keep our doors locked, but this time we left the front door unlocked for a bit after they arrived. My brother and I are both big dudes, so I feel pretty comfortable having the door unlocked for an hour or so. After a bit, we were all hanging out in the rear of the house. The front door opens to a short hallway next to the stairs, talking, and nothing is amiss. At one point, my wife noticed the front door was cracked open. We assumed my brother hadn't quite closed it all the way. She poked her head out to make sure our cat hadn't run out and noticed a man we've never seen in our neighborhood before just sitting in his car right across the street from our house looking at her. She gave him a weird look and closed and locked the door. A half hour later, it's time for our youngest to take a nap. He's two. She gets him up for a piggyback ride upstairs, and as soon as she gets upstairs, she starts absolutely screaming, there's someone in our house. Apparently, some guy was in our nursery just sitting in my wife's rocking chair. So while my brother ran upstairs, I grabbed a weapon. My brother physically forced the man downstairs and out of the house, and when we tried to get him to stop and sit down, he just wanders off. Didn't run, didn't speak, just slowly walked off in a daze. The man across the street starts yelling, It's okay, he's with me, etc. And between the confusion of that and the fact that we don't want to be grappling with strangers during a pandemic, we didn't restrain the man. Probably should have, but we were all just shocked. As the intruder wanders down the street, the other man starts telling us that they're from a group home in the area and he's the guy's caretaker or something. He said he was with him, watching him try other houses in the neighborhood. He won't give us a reason why he didn't stop the guy or call the police. Something about, I thought he knew somebody around here, was the best we could do, but his accent made it difficult to understand everything. 
He just didn't seem concerned at all about the fact that a man who was apparently in his care had just let himself into a stranger's home and hung out inside for a half hour. Ultimately, the police came and got all our information, and after a bit of a search, they did find the man and take him into custody, thankfully. The guy seemed to be pretty out of it. We couldn't tell if he was extremely drugged up or just really mentally incompetent, but the caretaker told us he was psychotic, so that makes me feel even worse. I suppose as home invasions go, we're thankful that this was an ultimately benign incident, but we sure won't feel right for a while. Obviously, we'll be more vigilant about locking doors going forward, and the odds of this are pretty minimal, but I'm not entirely sure where to go from here. My plans are get the name of the group home and speak with them directly. I want assurances that his caretaker is fired, at least. I'd also like to press charges against the caretaker, if possible. Any functioning adult should have known that what was happening was wrong and done something other than just sit outside and twiddle their effing thumbs. I'm not sure charges against the intruder are very useful if he is mentally incompetent. And our last story. HOA calls 911 on me for not allowing them to break into my house while I'm not there. I bought a house in a homeowners association. After moving from another state, I decided to find a new local lawyer. He helped me review the house documents and said everything was fine. For about a month, everything was indeed fine. But one day, returning from the store, I found a representative of the HOA wandering around my house taking notes in a notebook. I asked her what she was doing there and how she got into my house. The woman smugly replied that it was a random compliance check. She claimed she had a key and could check my house without warning. I was shocked and struggled to get her out. She yelled that she would find me for this. I called my lawyer and asked what to do. He said he knew about this clause in the contract and considered it normal, advising me to just let them into the house. This made me even more angry and I immediately went to change the locks. The next time Karen came, I was home. She tried to open the door with her key but couldn't, and she started yelling and banging on the door, This contradicts HOA rules! We are the law here! I told her to leave or I would call the police. Karen shouted, We will sue you for this violation! Get ready! By that time, I'd found another lawyer, and he said I was entirely within my rights to change the locks in my house. About an hour later, the woman returned with several HOA representatives and they began yelling that I must give them a new key or they would sue me. They also called the police. The police officer said it was a civil matter and told them not to gather on my lawn without permission. A few days later, I received a lawsuit from the HOA. I contacted my new lawyer again. His name's Brian. He's about 50 years old and has extensive experience. Plus, he's a pleasant person, which is rare for this profession, as I noticed. He immediately said we would win the case and advised me to go around the neighbors and ask if they wanted to get rid of such ridiculous rules. We won the case because the HOA rule contradicted the state private property law. They were unlawfully entering my house. I also found several like-minded neighbors who were also unhappy with such rules. We decided to file a class action lawsuit for the constant unlawful entry by HOA board members. As a result, the HOA leaders agreed to a deal where they would resign and we would remove the unnecessary rules. I didn't want to put a bunch of old people in jail. After that, life in the neighborhood became much more pleasant, and no one rummaged through my belongings while I was away. It's strange that people didn't sue the HOA the very first day after such rules. It's just awful. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.